I understand there might be a link between diabetes and Parkinson's disease. Can you explain a bit more about that, please? Yes. So it's clear from epidemiological research that if you have diabetes, you're at higher risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Originally, there was a bit of debate about this. So case control studies, you know, some showed there was an association, others didn't. But if you look in much bigger prospective cohort studies where you follow patients with diabetes over many years, all of these consistently show that there is an elevated risk of developing Parkinson's disease. And there's a, almost a dose response. So the more years you have diabetes for, the, i.e. the younger you got it, the bigger your risk of ultimately developing Parkinson's disease is. So there, there is a clear link between the two. Now, the first interpretation of this was, well, diabetes causes furring up of the blood vessels, and perhaps it's causing, you know, what we call cerebrovascular disease. And it's not Parkinson's disease it's causing, it's vascular Parkinsonism. And perhaps that's the, the explanation. And we, we know that patients with diabetes and Parkinson's disease tend to do worse. The initial interpretation of that was because they have both Parkinson's and vascular Parkinsonism, and that's why they do worse. But it's been shown in um, post-mortem data that, that people with diabetes and Parkinson's may do worse, but if you look at the brain, it's not because of more vascular disease. So there must be some other link between the two conditions. So one hypothesis is it's simply that having high blood sugar, which you have in diabetes, might be bad for brain health for some other reason. But if that was the case, then having you know, any diabetes drug might control the blood sugar and therefore reduce your risk of getting Parkinson's. But it seems that only some diabetes drugs will reduce your risk of Parkinson's and not all. So there might be something about not just blood sugar, but something related to a mechanism that's shared between diabetes and Parkinson's. And, and some of the most interesting work has been done by looking at the brains of people who have had both diabetes and Parkinson's. And there's a way of measuring what we call insulin resistance. And you can measure insulin resistance in, in, in the brain even after someone's died. And it's clear that patients with Parkinson's disease have elevated insulin resistance in the brain. And this, this is a, um, a, a clear shared phenomenon between what happens in diabetes, which is insulin resistance in the body, and what happens in Parkinson's, which is insulin resistance in the brain. So if you have a drug that can reduce insulin resistance in the body, and that, that a class of diabetes drugs called the GLP-1 receptor agonists, that's what they do. They reduce insulin resistance in the body. These drugs might also help reduce insulin resistance in the brain and therefore um, deal with some of the underlying cause of, of why patients with diabetes are getting Parkinson's disease. So just to clarify, we're talking about type 2 diabetes, which is to do with insulin resistance, isn't it, as opposed to type 1, which is more about lack of insulin. Have there been um, some drug trials with diabetes drugs to, to look at the effects on Parkinson's, and have they come up with any positive results? So this group of drugs called the GLP-1 receptor agonist, th these have been licensed for the treatment of diabetes since 2006. And if you look at big epidemiology studies, you can follow patients with diabetes and see what their risk of Parkinson's is. And as I said before, the risk of getting Parkinson's is elevated in people with diabetes. But if you look at the group of patients with diabetes who are treated with the GLP-1 receptor agonists, then their risk of Parkinson's disease falls far below the normal population, those people who don't have diabetes. So it, it's clear it doesn't just reduce your risk from the diabetes, it reduces your risk lower than people who don't have diabetes. So, so that epidemiology is quite strong. And in the laboratory, if you grow nerve cells in a dish, you can um, expose them to a range of different poisons or toxins. And of course, the nerve cells will, will die or, or, or deteriorate. But in the presence of one of the GLP-1 receptor agonists called exenatide, the, these nerve cells will, will survive despite adversity. And you can do the same in you know, rat or mouse models of Parkinson's disease, you can show that exenatide will slow down or stop the deterioration that, that, that would, would happen in, in these animal models. And so we've done two trials of using um, exenatide in patients with Parkinson's disease, and both of those trials were over a one-year period. And in both of them, patients using exenatide were better off 
at the end of one year than patients who are on a, a placebo act, acting as our controls. So we've got growing confidence that, that um, the use of exenatide or perhaps even others of these, this group of GLP-1 receptor agonists may do something to slow down the rate of progression of Parkinson's disease through an action on insulin resistance and inflammation within the brain. Is it your opinion that exenatide is a promising treatment for Parkinson's, therefore, for, for all patients with Parkinson's? Well, we'll, we'll have to see. We're, we're doing a phase three trial at the moment. So we've completed recruitment into this trial. And what we're doing this time around is following people for two years. And so the advantage of a prolonged follow-up means that we can see if we can firstly reproduce what we found before, that we see an advantage after one year. But if we find that that advantage is growing with each year of exposure to exenatide, then that would suggest it's not just hiding symptoms, it's actually doing something for the rate of decline of Parkinson's disease. And that would be the first drug um, ever to be shown to do that. So if we get the data that we're hoping to get, and then, of course, th this is potentially the, the, the first disease modifying treatment for Parkinson's. It might not be effective in every patient, but it has to be sufficiently effective in enough patients for us to, to detect that signal. And we might be able to look at our, our data and then identify, well, if there's um, a, a subgroup who respond the best, what is it about that subgroup that makes them respond better? And therefore, how can we tailor this drug to, to people who are most likely to respond to it in the future. Thank you. It sounds very exciting. For the first time in 200 years since the disease was described, there might be a disease-modifying therapy. So um, fingers crossed. If you're interested in finding out more about Parkinson's, subscribe for a new video every Thursday.